Hi everyone. It's been raining a lot here. It's been raining a lot all over Britain and probably other places as well. And it's been raining in my heart all day too. Um, some of you will have seen, you know, I read the Guardian's bit on the IPCC report, which is telling us again and again and again what we've actually known is happening all my life. When I've known about this and talked about this since the late 1950s, since I went to university, a lot, which was in the 60s, but at home in the 50s and the early 60s, because my dad knew about this and lots of people in the village knew about this. We didn't have words like climate change then, but we knew that we were putting out too many bad things into the air. And we knew that a lot of farmers, for instance, because I grew up in the country in farming district, a lot of farmers were putting a lot of muck and rubbish and stuff in the earth. In fact, that had been known, and that was what started Rudolf Steiner off with biodynamics, that the farmers came to him. And this was back in the 19 teens and 20s, because he gave his lectures in 1924, just before he died. So this was the 19 teens and the 1920s. Farmers in Europe were coming to him and saying, the soil's exhausted. We can't do anything. The soil is dying. The plants have no vigor. This is why he started biodynamics. And yet now, it seems now, people in the bloody media are just sort of saying, oh, well, it's real, it's real, it's real. I'm sorry. I'm upset. You probably gathered that. Shit, guys, it's been real for a hell of a long time. And it really got started in a big, bad, horrible way with the Age of Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. It had been going wrong before that. But my God, the Age of Enlightenment, when we all decided that magic and mystery and beauty and life and was all scientific and there wasn't really a soul and you could argue about it and there weren't really spirits and, you know, fairies and magic with us, these stupid, ignorant, savage peasants ideas. Yeah, it makes me angry. And that started off that everything is ours. We could control it. We can make the field grow what we want it to grow. We can make the animals into what we want them to be. We can cut down the forests and put up enormous, gorgeous, fabulous, wonderful concrete bloody palaces everywhere because that glorifies us. Look at human achievement. Look at the brilliance of human achievement, the brilliance of human architecture and buildings. And look, we made steam engines that go 100 billion miles an hour. I'm sorry, I'm very angry. I really am. And now people are just waking up to the fact that, oh my God, it's real. Why are we having these floods? Why has the climate changed so much that our weather and our seasons are not like this? Why do I get other people who are working magically sort of saying, but I can't celebrate midwinter properly because there isn't any snow anymore. And snowdrops come up long before Imolk and it's all wet and raining in May and the May hasn't come out, the May blossom. 
and the harvest goes all wrong, so we can't do harvest properly. Why? Why do you think that is, you stupid people? Not you. I'm sorry. I really am in a state today. And I might suddenly burst into tears because this hurts me so much and I've been watching it for so long. My first husband, Bob, dear sweet soul, we're still friends. Just, we weren't making it as a couple. But he was a lovely man. He is a lovely man. And when we first got together, and you know, I was still a student at university, and, and he was a garage mechanic or something. Yeah, garage mechanic at the time. And we needed some kind of car thing to travel around in. So he got this old post office van. Some of you may remember they were, they were sort of red van things, and a bit like the ones today, only, you know, they weren't. <laughs> this was back in 19... Uh, 69, 70. Um, and he converted it then to run off methane um, from a friend's um, septic tank and his chickens. Yeah, this was 1969, 70. And we ran our beat up old post office van on methane whenever we could get it, which was most of the time, but when we couldn't, it would convert back to running on petrol. You think this is new, you guys? It isn't. It's just nobody ever listened to us. Nobody ever listened to us when we shouted about the whales and the Amazonian rainforests and everything like this. Nobody listened. They said, oh, they're, they're nice little people. Oh, dear little teenagers. Aren't they cute? Look, they're so pretty. Mm. You stupid gits who didn't listen. <sighs> oh, God. And here we are. We're right in the flipping middle of it. It's right in our faces. It's happening. I mean, does anybody else out there, please tell me, is there somebody else out there or am I talking this all to myself? I don't know. <laughs> tell me and, you know, at least sort of pat me on the head if you're out there. <laughs> Did anybody else do the big butterfly count? It was pitiful this year. It's been getting worse and worse and worse. I've been doing it for 20 years now, more, and... Hi, Yvette. Thank you, darling. I hope I'm not driving you completely bonkers. But I've been doing the big butterfly count, as I said, for 20 years. And every year, there are less butterflies. Used to be the garden at this time of year would be full of them. You practically have to sort of wade your way through them. And a couple of years, I've had that. Still, and yet, you know, you get a cloud of butterflies in the garden, just sit there going, Oh my god, this year. My husband came in, it was the last day of the butterfly count on Sunday, and he came in on Sunday and he said, I just counted five cabbage white butterflies out there. And he was really thrilled. Thank you, Patty. He was really thrilled because he counted five, five white butterflies. The large whites. I've seen one peacock. And I don't live in a town. I live in a beautiful out of the way place in the middle of an organic farm with a wildlife garden and masses of butterfly food and that. Why didn't we have them? What was the spring like this year? Do you remember that back that far? It was cold and windy and wet. And that is when the butterflies are hatching. That is when they're coming out. So they came out and they drowned and blew away and starved. That's what happened. So when people say nice words like, oh, the bad spring spoilt the hatching of the butterflies, and they say it on BBC News, and it all sounds like, oh, well, there you are. Never mind, have a new hat, dear. No, 
They drowned and they starved. That's what we've done. And the IPCC scientists have at last had the guts to come out and say, well, they've actually known for a long, long time, 30, 40 years. But governments sort of say, oh, but you can't say it's humans because that will ruin ICI's profits or Nestle's profits or some other bastard pharma company's profits. So you can't say that. You must just say, well, we think it could be because of blah, 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 and then use lots of long words and nobody will listen, which worked. Will anybody listen now? Did anybody hear the latest? Yeah, snakes and toads here too, yeah. Did anybody listen or read or see the, I can't remember what his name is, or some government twat who said, it's really important that we wake up to this uh, it's unequivocal disaster that is happening because of climate change, but actually we'll still carry on pumping out coal and stuff from fumes from power stations and we'll still fly everybody everywhere every five minutes and we'll still keep on making masses of cars that pollute everything and we'll still carry on building everything up because we've got to have profit we've got to have money i mean that yeah morons is about it you know We've, we've got to, the people who got the money, most of them, and I, I'm sure there are one or two that are okay, because there has to be everywhere, doesn't there? Yes, please. But most of them, it's their money. You know, is Boris Johnson poor that he has to use our tax money to stick flipping awful pictures all over bloody 10 Downing Street, which is a monstrosity anyway? used to walk past it when you could walk past it in those days. And who cares? I was watching, and this is part of my, I've been depressed all weekend, part of my depression. I was watching um, Sky Dancer on Saturday. That's um, Chris Packham and Megan um, doing the Hen Harrier Day. And they don't just stick to hen harriers. They talk about all of this stuff and what we could be doing, if only we would. And there's a bloke whose name I can never properly remember. He, I do know it. Anyway, he's written this book, Who Owns England? Not even Britain, just England. And it ends up there's about 50 people own all the land in this country. Not us, not the people. It's these 50 bloody millionaires. And some of them are damn foreigners anyway. Excuse me, I'm not being racist. It's just that, excuse me, this is my land. You've got your own land. Go and buy that. And they buy it and they're posh mansions or places for fabulous parties or shooting estates, very often shooting estates, particularly driven grouse moor shooting estates where you really screw the land. Or you keep herds of deer that you shoot because, you know, you've got a, a, a few guests from Middle Eastern and American and African countries who want to come and shoot some of our game. It's called trophy hunting. You know, dear? Hmm. Oh, by the way, talking of trophy hunting, guess who does trophy hunting in case you think she's lovely? Kate's sister our future queen's sister and her. And there have been pictures of the pair of them when girls weekend out trophy shooting. Oh, wow, how nice. And this is what we've got up front ruling us. Ye gods, no. Yes, I could stir things up. The only one who seems to have the slightest amount of sense is the one who got out. I know he's upsetting America. Good idea, probably, but don't worry about it. But, you know, and the, how 
House of Commons is full of people like that. An awful lot of them are very rich, especially in the Tory party, but not only in the Tory party. There are practically no ordinary Joes in Parliament. There's one or two. There's um, Mary, can't remember her name, who's uh, the young lassie in the Scottish National Party who stood up and shouted a bit. Haven't heard her from her for a bit, so either she's not there or she's given up shouting. I've known one or two politicians who actually do stand on their hind legs and shout. But, I mean, that's out of, what is it, 600 of the buggers we've got in there? Two. Big deal. They're going to really make a difference, aren't they? And we call ourselves a democracy. We're not. We're ruled by upper classes. Might be slightly different to the born born again money. Um, well, born again money, or then there's the, the ancient money. You know, I can trace my family right back to the Norman Conquest. Well, bugger, you were a bastard who pinched my land then, weren't you? I'm Celtic and Saxon, so I think we'll, I imagine what I can think of the Normans. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say people are all right and it's okay that people steal land and it's okay that people rule other people and make other people do what they want to do. No, it's not okay. It's not okay at all. And it's not okay that some people can have anything they want and do anything they want and other people can't. <sighs> Come back to Earth, Ellen. You've got a problem here. And I, God knows whether we're going to make any difference. I have no idea. God knows actually whether we've even got time to make any difference. You know, we've got a government saying, oh, in 25 years we'll be doing that. 25 years, that's a generation, guys. If you had a kiddie today, in 25 years, it'd be a grown-up. So, in a generation? We haven't got a generation to do this in. We've got about six months, probably. And we can put it all right, you know. We can plant five billion trees and it'll put it all right. It won't. It won't put the ice back in the North and South Pole and Greenland and everywhere else that we've lost the ice. Ice is important. Ice was part of what made us the lovely, gentle planet with a gentle climate that, it, that we have, the blue planet that was swelled in white clouds. Ice helped make that. And we've killed the ice. And it's still dying. And it ain't going to stop. The permafrost and the tundra is melting. Just how there is no global warming can that be? Can't. Doesn't. We need to rewild. We need to rewild ourselves, as I was saying last Monday. We desperately need to rewild our hearts. We need to stop believing what anybody in authority or anybody with alphabet soup after their name says to us. You know, I mean, my, <laughs> sorry, my, my rude parent um, used to say, you know, so-and-so with his doctorate and his alphabet soup after his name, academic or whatever, when he sits on the, on the toilet, his trousers are hanging around his ankle, same as mine are. And that's worth thinking about. They ain't nobody. They're just people that we, and this is back into the spirit stuff, we have given our power to, because we never call them to account. And when we do, and they spurge long words and legalese at us, we go, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, all right then, sorry. Mm. Instead of going, bumph, no, you bastard. Shut up and listen. 
Of course, we're not even allowed to throw to rotten tomatoes at them anymore now. At least you could do that when I was growing up. Yeah, tomato really hurts. Yeah, mm, not that much. Not that it's an egg. We need to be able to complain. We need to be able to shout. We need to be able to demonstrate. We need to be able to say no in a big way without being afraid, as all the Extinction Rebellion people were, when they shut bridges and shut roads. Good on them. Yes, we don't want this. And we don't want all the sort of people who say, oh, but I needed to go to the shops. Just for one day, you could actually manage not to. You could actually manage to get your arse in gear and help these guys and at least ask them, why, what, what's going on? Why are you doing this? What do you think? And then listening without wanting to put them down because they're obviously terrorists and whatever kind of ist it might be that you don't want. We lie down and take it too much. Do you remember the kettling about 10 years ago when students and quite a lot of other people decided to complain about... Well, do you remember what they even complained about? Austerity. Austerity which hurts the little people, the people like us, like you and me. It doesn't hurt the Boris Johnsons of this world or the David Camerons as it was at the time. And they complained. So they shut them into cul-de-sacs and back streets of London and they wouldn't let them out and they wouldn't let any, even any drink in. I mean, it was Hitler and all his gang. Hitler, eat your heart out, guys. We're doing it better than you. So it's a propaganda. Goebbels, eat your heart out too. Propaganda of the governments especially the Western governments, all of them nowadays, you know, I mean, wipes Goebbels off the floor. It just is hopeless. Where was I? I don't know. In a state. Yeah, okay, I was in a state. Can I come back to Earth into a bit of a less state, having screamed for a little bit? And thank you so much, guys, for letting me scream. I might scream again in a bit, but I won't for a minute now, okay? We've got to change. I was scribbling stuff this morning with more tea, of course. I know, tea miles. We have a problem. A big problem that we can't run away from because it's there over us all the time. It's called climate change. It's called global warming, and it's been brought on by us. By us thinking that we own it, that we can make it do anything. And we're getting more people now who are saying, we need rewilding, we need to do this, we need to change. But every time they try and make the argument for change, what is it that they say? They say, oh, but the mycorrhiza in the forest, they're really helpful because they, they make the land better and they connect all the trees up and they make things grow better. So we are better off. And the sphagnum moss in the box, which everybody is quietly draining and digging up the peat in the garden and all this kind of shit, and the sphagnum moss is wonderful stuff because it soaks up masses of carbon from the atmosphere and that's really helpful to us. And every time they talk about something, you know, we need more forests because they're good for humans. They're good for humans. They make humans happy. Anybody seeing the point that I'm saying? We're not doing this for Mother Earth. 
We're not doing this for the planet that births us. We're doing it for me, 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 selfish little me. I won't do it unless there's some good in it for me. Yeah, planned obsolescence. <laughs> and before that, my girl, yeah, indeed, Yvette. Um, fridges, one of the best, and cars always are. Yeah, obsolescence. So you, you make things so that people get money. You make things so that we get good out of it. And you're going to do rewilding because it's good for humans. Oh, it's good for the, good for, um, the Earth as well. Secondary. That's what we've got to change. We stop looking at what's in it for me, like a bloody gangster. And we start saying, Earth, dear, what do you need from me? What do you need me to do? Can I help in any way? And we do it for the Earth, not for selfish me, me, me reasons. And that's the problem that has got us into this shit in the first place. Because, let's take from the Industrial Revolution, everybody wanted money, everybody wanted a job, everybody wanted to make more money. I mean, even the little people, I mean, the, the way they had to live was awful. But it was still about money and about me. We've got to stop thinking of me. We have to start thinking of the planet, of nature, of the trees, of the animals, of the birds, of the oceans. They must come first. They must be the reason why we do things because until we get to that, until we start doing things for other people for non-selfish reasons, we won't stop doing the harm. How can we? Because if something becomes me or them, then it's me. Hold that in your heart for a minute. Just hold that idea. What will I do if it's me or them? What will I do if it's me or them? In an awful lot of cases, it'll be you first. That's what has to change. That's what changes when you work in this way. And it does change. I thoroughly enjoy my lovely wildlife garden. I really do. It's gorgeous. I love sitting in it. I love being in it. I like working in it. But I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the spirit of place, the land here that wants it. And I do it the way she wants it. And quite often that turns out to be pretty good for me too. In fact, it always does. I'm doing it for the birds. I'm doing it for the butterflies. I'm doing it for the bees. I'm doing it for the little animals and for the big animals, the foxes and the badgers too, and the pine martins, if only they would come up here. And I'm doing it for the clouds and the water and the trees and the land. That's why I'm doing it. You know, that's actually why I do all the writing and teaching that I do. I want people to know, I want people to feel it for themselves and do that. And I want people to get into this thing that it's actually lovely and beautiful that you are caring for others and that you have, as far as you can today, and it'll be different tomorrow, as far as you can today, not being selfish And we've got to stop that. We've got to stop being selfish. Selfish has got to be uncool. Selfish has got to be not the way people are. It used to be much more like that. It was much less selfish amongst the 
poorer and Middle East sort of people where I grew up in the villages in Devon. And they cared about each other. They cared about if they saw me wandering around in the wrong sort of place when I was about five, it was, what are you doing here? Come on then, let's take you home. And people noticed, people cared. Nobody dares to care about anybody else now. And it's not cool. Probably is amongst younger people. Younger people seem to be better at caring. I suppose because they don't have so much to lose. I mean, this is the problem. If you start caring about other people and deciding that you are guardian to things and you don't own them, it means your whole life changes and you don't have a lot of the things. You know, you don't desire a foreign hol holiday necessarily. You don't desire a new car. You don't desire a new sofa or whatever the latest thing is on the TV. You actually know how to do it for yourself. And your children know that too. They will learn that. They can learn that. They do learn that. It'd be really nice if we didn't teach our children to be out for themselves and selfish. We told them that that wasn't cool. And we helped them really love the bees and the ants in the garden. And not to run over something in the road when they learn to drive and to worry about the birds and not to harm a tree when they were out, you know, and they were bored and they were stabbing a tree with their knife. Do you think the tree doesn't feel? Or breaking branches off because they want to be tough guy. Do you think the tree doesn't feel? Even science tells us it does. So we need to change. And my dream is that we can change and that we will change and that we will stop being selfish and that we will do things because we care about Mother Earth and that we know that we are here to help her and guard her. And like I was saying last week, one of the big things of helping and learning to do that is... You don't get a bright idea about how to help Mother Earth. Well, you probably do. But you don't promptly act on it and think that because you're human, you know best. You think, I'm human. I'm young. I'm the youngest species on planet Earth. I don't know if I know. I'll ask Mother Earth. She's been here for 4.7 billion years. She probably does know. So... You go along and you find a way and you find someone to help you if you don't know yourself. And you learn how to say, Mother, I can see things aren't going well for you here. Is there anything I can do? Could you show me what to do? And I know from my students, because this is what I teach them, I know that people get the hang of it damn quickly. Once they're encouraged, once they're shown that they can do this. I've recently become a member of a group called ARC. Um, ARK stands for Acts of Regenerative Kindness. It was started by this um, ex-landscape gardener who um, she did her garden at Chelsea. Um, so I, I, I like this because... I used to be a, a garden designer and I did actually three gardens at uh, Hampton Court. Um, one, the middle one of which I really loved. The other two were sort of like, I was doing them as a client. <laughs> and the, the middle one was mine. And that was really wild. And I thought, yeah, and so I look at her stuff. And a couple of my students uh, into her too, and into this. So I thought, oh, I've got to look at this. And it's really good. And 
there are she, there are thousands of people in her group, two, three thousand people, probably more. And these are people who want to do it and who are trying to do it, who've like let their lawn, their front lawn grow dandelions despite what their neighbours say. And they're letting their grass grow long and they're just mowing a pathway through. And they're looking for, they're just leaving the lawn alone for a year or so to see what flowers come up in it that the seed bank was already in there that the mowing just kept killing so they're waiting to see what the earth has to give them before they try and dump stuff on her so they're starting to learn to ask and you know there's an awful lot of those people who they know there's a spiritual component to the earth that that is actually where the life comes from that there is a thing called magic and they may not know much about it but they know it's there and they're starting to learn to listen and that's the sort of good side of today but you know when i get really depressed it's probably the same for all of you you start feeling you know that everything you, you can't find anywhere outside outside of yourself that isn't awful and you look outside and you know there's some ghastly machine going past you or there's some beastly aeroplane or helicopter making a din at the top of you or the farmer down the road is spraying his damn crops or something or you're in a town you know and there's all the litter and the dirt and people just kicking lampposts and and the thought of kicking a lamppost because i'm angry and bored well, it's really hard for me. It may seem nuts to you, but the lamppost is made of metal, which is made of actually part of the rock of the earth. Metal comes from rock, melted rock. So that's got a spirit in it. And I kick it because I'm cross. So I kick the mother. Because I don't even know, because people, you know, my parents and my school and everything has told me, that's an animal, that can't feel anything. We used to say that about animals, didn't we, and about fish, and about birds, and about trees. We used to say that, didn't we? Some of us at least know better now. It's about time we started worrying about the lampposts and the gateposts and the wall. Yeah, it, it means getting that deep into it you start really everything and this is all the old traditions say this everything has spirit every single thing this poor blue pen not poor blue pen you're a good blue pen this has spirit in it and if i make the effort i can feel things from it i can hear it Okay, I'm nuts, whatever you want to say. But it's true. My computer does, my laptop here. The table that I fell in love with this table a long, long, long time ago, about 40 odd years ago. And I found it and I bought it and we're friends. And it's my table and it's where I do things and it supports me. And I can actually even almost feel it like hugging me when I get down like this. And my favorite chair does too. I mean, how many of you with kids have got a kid who's got a favorite, you know, blanket? Yeah, that blanket is alive to your child until you try and tell your child that it isn't. So don't, please, because it is. We need to rewild in that way. That's wild. That's knowing the spirit and everything. That's knowing that everything has an opinion and actually may know better than we do. And that if we ask, we might actually learn quite a lot. That's rewilding. So we learn to work with the land. And we see this poor land that's been all forestry commission, you know, nothing but Sitka spruce on it everywhere. And it's growing Sitka spruce. And there was a good thing I put it up on, um, well, it's a middling good thing, um, from Countryfile about its place that um, is rewilding in Scotland. 
and it was all Sitka spruce. And when they first went there, they thought, well, we'll cut all that down and we'll put native trees in there. Fortunately, they got probably three or four synapses that were all working, not just the two. And they stopped. And they got red squirrels in the pines, in the Sitka spruce. And they got pine martens in the Sitka spruce. And they'd even got black grouse. And they thought, oh, these creatures are reasonably happy here. We need to be careful before we knock it down. Because these creatures have a life. And we can't come along and say, now, go to their own little red squirrels and be good while we just set up a decent forest for you and then you can be happy. You do not do that. Ever. I said I'd shout again. You're allowed to. <laughs> Sorry. But you don't. That is not how you work. You sit with, you work with, you be with the spirit of the land you are. Good, Yvette, we need more and more and more of us. To teach it, to speak it, to say it. Listen, ask, listen, learn the language of the land where you live. Learn the language of the trees that you live with, of the grass that you live with, of the little bugs that run around in the earth that help everything grow. Learn their language. They are all speaking. They are all conscious. They all know. Learn what they're saying and listen. And never, ever, ever have. Well, this is one of Dad's. Never get yourself nose best syndrome. He used to spell it N-O-S-E hyphen best syndrome. Jung said things like that too. He said, never know best, never know first. Always come from a place of unknowing. Do that with everything around you and all the people, your family, your friends. Never assume that they're stupid. Bloody Victorian idea of, you know, oh, they're dreadful savages. We need to Christianize them and give them proper clothes to wear and tell them to eat cooked food. That's what people did. And we still do it. When we try and make our dog behave in a certain way or make our horse behave in a certain way, like that frightful woman who fortunately at least got thrown out. She never ought to, I mean, she ought to be locked up. And the people who made the rules of that stupid competition anyway, because if you actually read the rules, they're ridiculous. I'm talking about this stupid woman in the, in the decathlon with the horse. Punched her horse. What? Precisely. Because it didn't do what she wanted. It had never met her before. And it wasn't used to being bullied into submission. And an awful lot of riders all over the world, they bully their horses and beat them into submission. I've seen it. I've seen whips going around heads and ears and under the stomach and people kicking under the stomach of their horse because it hasn't behaved. This is what people do. I've seen someone with a hammer bang a hammer up into the horse, into the stomach of the horse because it wouldn't do what he was told, telling it to. How? Why? How can people do that? How do they ever get to that sort of stage of where they can be like that? So never mind, you know, what they do to other humans. And I mean, that's pretty appalling. It's pretty appalling what we even do to our own families half the time. Let alone the people we don't like or who annoy us. And don't worry, I can get some pretty vicious thoughts going when people annoy me. Like to the bloke who's banged a hammer into my pony's stomach once. Fortunately, I was quite young and didn't have very good magic because I didn't have very good control either. And I would probably have knocked the, I probably knocked his head off, but I didn't. So we're all safe. 
Yeah, they call they call it breaking your horse, breaking in your horse. Breaking it so that it will do what you tell it. And the same with your dog. People try and do it with a cat. Fortunately, cats are mildly savvy and they usually walk if they possibly can when they end up in a place like that. People I've seen people do it with their cattle and their sheep and their pigs and their hens. I've seen it. And it's all done because I'm in control. I'm in charge. Me, me, me. I'm thinking what I need, not what you need. I don't care what you need. You just give me what I want and that'll be fine. Sound a bit like a gangster movie to you? Because that's how we're taught to be. When you're not normal, you must behave properly in here. Don't complain. Don't shout. He's he, he's an authority. You you don't shout at him. You say, please may I ask a question. And you say, oi! And throwing a tomato at him. It's called breaking your people in. And then you give them lots of nice adverts and things to want and things to work for and um, ladders to climb so that they can get on and then they know they're being right and they're killing all the dandelions like everybody else in the street. And we've got to stop this. We've got to change. We must, must change. My dream, I wrote my dream down a bit this morning. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to bugger off because I'm probably driving you all insane. My dream, that humans look at everything and feel everything and they ask, they say, what am I doing to help nature? Am I doing anything to harm nature? Nature, will you tell me? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? And then changing because of that. That's my dream. That we can all ask and that we can all say, oops, got that wrong, I'm really sorry, what can I do to put it right? And we will say this to the tree, to the land, to the farm as well as to each other, because we need that too. That's it. I'm going off to Wild, and hopefully I shall be feeling a little better next Monday, and I will come back and talk with you again. Can you give me some ideas about something to talk about? Ask me questions that hopefully do not get me into this awful state that I've been in today, but it's been good to be with you. It has actually helped me, so thank you, everyone. Bye for now, folks. See you next Monday, half past six. Bye then. <laughs>